Welcome to our webinar series, Non-Invasive Prenatal Testing, Background, Science, and Clinical Implementation. Module 3 addresses clinical implementation of NIPT, both, including both pre-test and post-test counseling considerations. After reviewing this webinar, you should have a better understanding as to how NIPT can be effectively implemented into clinical practice and how to best manage both positive and negative NIPT results. Case examples will be used to help illustrate these considerations. Several societies have released position statements over the past few years addressing the use of cell-free DNA testing in the clinical practice, including the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists with the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, the National Society of Genetic Counselors, and the International Society of Prenatal Diagnosis. Let's review key points from a few of these statements. In early 2016, ACOG, in conjunction with SMSM, released two updated practice bulletins that replaced the 2007 practice bulletin on prenatal testing. Both bulletins state that prenatal screening or diagnostic testing should be offered to all women, regardless of their aneuploidy risk. In the first bulletin, number 162, entitled Prenatal Diagnostic Testing for Genetic Disorders, the committee reviews the current status of diagnostic testing, which includes a review of recent studies addressing updated procedural-related risks, as well as the presence of chromosomal mosaicism in both choranic villus sampling and amniocentesis samples. Bulletin 163, entitled Screening for Fetal Aneuploidy, addresses the issue of no-call NIPT results. Women whose cell-free DNA screening results are not reported, are indeterminate or uninterpretable, should receive further genetic counseling and be offered comprehensive ultrasound evaluation and diagnostic testing given an increased risk of aneuploidy. Furthermore, this bulletin recommends confirmatory testing with a diagnostic procedure following all positive NIPT results before any irreversible action is taken. As with prior statements, ACOG and SMSM continue to address the importance of pre- and post-test counseling, including a referral to a genetic counselor or other specialist with genetic training and expertise to provide an individualized risk assessment. In 2013, the International Society of Prenatal Diagnosis, or ISPD, released their position statement supporting NIPT as the most effective method for screening for trisomies 21 and 18 and that these tests are not considered diagnostic. In addition, they address the need for laboratories to release information pertaining to test metrics, including test performance, test failure rates, and turnaround time. In early 2015, ISPD published an update to their antiquity screening statement. They again addressed the need for laboratories to provide ongoing test metrics. There were a few new points included as well. First, they support offering NIPT to women of all risk levels based on supportive evidence. Second, they state that explaining the results in the context of a population positive predictive value or odds of affected given positive results is appropriate. And lastly, with regards to additional test offerings, they state that when cell-free DNA screening is extended to microdeletion and microduplication syndrome or rare trisomies, Testing should be limited to clinically significant disorders or well-defined syndromes. The Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists published their scientific impact paper on NIPT in 2014. This paper addresses the benefits, limitations, and ethical considerations of NIPT, as well as various options for how NIPT can be implemented into clinical practice. This paper states that detection of Down syndrome by maternal plasma DNA testing will alter the way prenatal diagnosis and screening is delivered in the UK. Lastly, this paper acknowledges the potential impact NIPT has on prenatal aneuploidy screening and that obstetricians need to be aware of all counseling issues. Based on the societal guidelines we just reviewed, Aneuploidy screening, including cell-free DNA screening, or NIPT, should be made available to all patients regardless of their baseline risk. 
when we think about patients who may be at increased aneuploidy risk, that includes those with one or more of the following factors. Maternal age-related risk, positive serum screening from either a first or second trimester screen, abnormal ultrasound findings, including both major and minor findings, a history suggestive of trisomy 21, trisomy 18, trisomy 13, or a sex chromosome aneuploidy, which may be related to a previous miscarriage or birth of an affected child. And lastly, a couple where one parent is a carrier of a balanced translocation involving one of the chromosomes tested. It is important to be aware that recommendations and guidelines may vary among geographical areas. Similar to traditional serum screening, the distribution curves in NIPT for values reported in euploid or unaffected pregnancies and aneuploid or affected pregnancies will overlap. However, the region of overlap is much smaller compared to other screening methods. Please refer back to Module 2, where we reviewed the distribution curves of traditional serum screening. On the left of this graph is the distribution curve for an NIPT result in a euploid pregnancy. On the right is the distribution curve for an NIPT result in an aneuploid pregnancy. The small area of overlap in the center illustrates the false positive and false negative. Every laboratory deals with this region differently. Some laboratories will choose a single value and draw a line as a threshold and report either negative or positive results depending on which side of the line the result falls. Other laboratories use a dual threshold approach and refer to this area of overlap as a borderline result. Some labs may apply a risk score to these results as well. When patients receive a borderline result, genetic counseling is recommended about these results in the context of their individual clinical picture. As with any test, there are limitations to non-invasive prenatal testing. NIPT does not provide information about all types of birth defects, including isolated structural abnormalities, genetic syndromes, or multifactorial conditions, such as generalized learning disabilities. Second, there is not an NIPT assay that is 100% specific or 100% sensitive. False positive and false negative may occur. This is another reason NIPT is considered to be a screening test. Some false positive results may be explained by other etiologies. Cell-free DNA is mostly placental in origin, when a chromosomal change is only present in placental cells and not confirmed in the fetus, it is known as confined placental mosaicism, or CPM. This can lead to an abnormal NIPT result in an unaffected fetus. Cell-free DNA from a demise co-twin may also impact an NIPT result. The length of time that cell-free DNA remains in maternal circulation following a demise or vanished co-twin is unknown. In addition, an abnormal result may represent changes from the mother including a maternal chromosome abnormality, either a full or mosaic, or a maternal health condition, such as a maternal malignancy. There have been cases reported where an abnormal NIPT with multiple aneuploidies was shown to be related to a maternal malignancy. In 2015, Bianchi and all published a case series reporting on six patients with a diagnosis of occult maternal malignancy following an abnormal NIPT where the fetal karyotype was reportedly normal. Discordant results have also been reported in patients where the mother's medical history revealed a prior organ transplant. We will address the biological etiologies associated with discordant results in more detail in Module 4. Given the various limitations and considerations that are necessary for proper implementation of NIPT, the factors that may be addressed prior to testing include, but are not limited to, obtaining a detailed medical, pregnancy, and family history to assess whether NIPT is an appropriate option. For example, if a patient is known to have a karyotype anomaly herself, such as 47XXX or triple X syndrome, this should be taken into account when the patient is counseled about options for X and Y analysis as this history will impact the patient's NIPT results. 
Second, a discussion of benefits and limitations of NIPT to enable informed consent should be considered. This includes, but is not limited to, a discussion of all possible result types, the limitations of the test in detecting all possible health concerns, and overall performance statistics, including the potential for a false positive or false negative result, as well as the potential for discordant gender. And lastly, this, the discussion should include a review of recommendations based on societal guidelines that confirmatory testing is available following all, following all abnormal or no-call results. All pre- and post-test counseling should be non-directive and done in a manner to promote informed choice. Ultimately, the, the decision that a patient and her partner make regarding prenatal screening and testing is their own. In the next few slides, we will review clinical considerations after NIPT results have been reported. We will include considerations following negative, positive, and canceled NIPT results. Following a negative NIPT result where aneuploidy is not detected, the provider may wish to review the limitations of NIPT, including its test performance and ability to detect only specific fetal aneuploidies. Test results should always be used in the context of all available clinical findings. The provider can then determine the most appropriate next steps, if any, for a particular patient. Following a positive result, which includes both an aneuploidy detected and borderline result, confirmatory testing via chorionic villus sampling or amniocentesis should be offered per societal guidelines, as we discussed earlier. Additional testing or screening options can be considered based on the patient's individual clinical picture. If prenatal testing is declined, postnatal karyotype analysis via cord blood or products of conception is recommended. If an NIPT is canceled, a redrawal is an option. As we discussed a few moments ago, both the 2016 ACOG Practice Bulletin and the 2015 ISPB statement address the issue of test failures or no calls. Data included in clinical experience publications have shown rates of aneuploidy as high as 22% in women who failed to receive a result from cell-free DNA testing. For this reason, the ACOG Practice Bulletin on Aneuploidy Screening and the Committee Opinion on NIPT state that women whose results are not reported indeterminate or uninterpretable, meaning a no-call result, from cell-free DNA screening should be offered genetic counseling, comprehensive ultrasound evaluation, and diagnostic testing because of an increased risk of aneuploidy. In addition, repeat screening may not be su successful in over 50% of redrawals, therefore resulting in delays which may limit reproductive options in some inst instances and increase parental anxiety for some patients. The ISPD statement addresses this by recommending a reappraisal of the use of cell-free DNA versus alternative testing when the first NIPT fails to report a result. As discussed in Module 2, ultrasounds are recommended by standard guidelines during the pregnancy. After NIPT results have been reported, ultrasounds are recommended if not already complete. Isolated congenital anomalies not detected by NIPT can be detected with detailed anatomy assessments. In some cases, additional serum screening may be indicated, such as a maternal serum alpha fetoprotein for the assessment of open neural tube defects. This again may vary based on the individual provider. Now we will use some case examples that demonstrate various ways NIPT could be utilized in practice. Our first case demonstrates how NIPT may be used in a patient after a soft ultrasound marker is reported on ultrasound and is otherwise low risk for aneuploidy based on both maternal age and serum screen results. As a reminder, Soft ultrasound markers are findings that increase the likelihood of aneuploidy over a patient's baseline risk, although these are not considered to be major structural anomalies. An intracardiac epigenic focus is a bright spot that appears in the fetal heart. This patient was offered the option for NIPT, amniocentesis, 
or to decline further testing. She elected NIPT, which was negative for aneuploidy in chromosomes 21, 18, and 13. Based on this result, the patient declined invasive testing. Case 2 is a 33-year-old woman at 10 weeks gestation. She had a prior miscarriage of a fetus affected with trisomy 21 and was therefore at an increased risk of recurrence. During the genetic consult, she was offered multiple options, including traditional serum screening, diagnostic testing, NIPT, and ultrasound. The patient opted for NIPT. Results were positive for trisomy 21 in a male fetus. The patient was counseled about her positive results, taking into consideration her previous trisomy 21 pregnancy. At 12 weeks, the patient had an ultrasound which revealed a cystic hygroma demonstrated in the image here. Based on all of this information, she opted to proceed with diagnostic testing which confirmed the diagnosis of trisomy 21 in this fetus. Having the NIPT result in the first trimester enabled this patient time to make an informed decision regarding pregnancy management. The next case is a 42-year-old woman at 12 weeks gestation with an increased first trimester screen risk of 1 in 32 for Down syndrome. In patients that are over 40, the false positive rate with traditional serum screening is increased over, given their increased baseline risk secondary, secondary to maternal age. Her provider offered additional screening, invasive testing, ultrasounds, and non-invasive prenatal testing. The patient declined diagnostic testing and opted instead for NIPT. Her NIPT results were negative for aneuploidies in chromosomes 21, 18, 13, as well as sex chromosome anomalies. Given the negative NIPT result for this patient, followed by a normal ultrasound at 20 weeks gestation, the patient declined amniocentesis. In this case, NIPT was a good alternative for a patient with a positive serum screen result who was unsure about pursuing invasive diagnostic procedures. This next case demonstrates how NIPT is an alternative option for information in patients who have undergone assisted reproductive therapy to achieve a pregnancy. Often, patients who pursue assisted reproductive therapies are hesitant to pursue diagnostic testing given the risk of pregnancy loss. This is a 38-year-old patient who was interested in accurate testing but uncomfortable with the risks associated with CVS and amniocentesis. She was offered a traditional screening, invasive diagnostic testing, non-invasive prenatal testing, and ultrasound. This patient shows NIPT, which did not report aneuploidy in any of the chromosomes tested. Based on the negative NIPT results and a detailed anatomy ultrasound with no significant findings, the patient declined diagnostic testing. This last case involves a 27-year-old woman with a 1 in 5 risk of trisomy 18 on her quad screen. At 23 weeks gestation, an ultrasound confirmed the presence of multiple ultrasound anomalies, both major and minor findings. The healthcare provider offered amniocentesis and non-invasive prenatal testing. The patient opted to begin with NIPT given her later gestational age. Amniocentesis was detected for chromosome 18. Confirmatory amniocentesis was consistent with trisomy 18. This demonstrates how NIPT can be used when other serum screening options are no longer available based on gestational age cutoff. This concludes the third module of non-invasive prenatal testing, background science, and clinical implementation. Thank you.